Nam Thuy Lâm Babar Shi Jaram Yad Apatra Pakulam Pitushcha Bartushcha Nayasya Dastama Katang Matis Te Vagatanya Tasatam Kula Prasu Te Kula Dushanam Tridam Babarshi Jaram Yara Patra Pakulam Pitrishya Bartuscha Nayasya Dastama Katang Matis Te Vagatanya Tasatam Kula Prasu Te Kula Dushanam Tridam Babar Shijaram Yad Apatra Pakulam Patrishya Bartuscha Nayasya Dastama Mati, Mati, your consciousness, your consciousness. of a gata has, has gone down. Anyata, Anyata otherwise. otherwise. Satan, Satan, of the most respectable. The most respectable. Kula, prasute, Kula prasute, oh my daughter born in the family. Oh Kula dushanam, who are the degradation of the family. Two, but idam this babarshi you are maintaining jaram a paramour yet as it is apatrapa without shame kulam the dynasty pitu of your father cha and part two of your husband cha and now you see, you are bringing down. Adaptama, downward into darkness or hell. Translation. Oh, my daughter, who were born in a respectable family, how have you degraded your consciousness in this way? How is it that you are shamelessly maintaining a power more? You will thus degrade the dynasties of both your father and your husband to a hellish life. Purport. It is quite clear that according to Vedic culture, a woman who accepts a paramour or second husband in the presence of the husband she has married is certainly responsible for the degradation of her father's family and the family of her husband. The rules of Vedic culture in this regard are strictly observed in the respectable families of Brahmanas, Chatriyas, and Vaishyas even today. Only the sudras are degraded in this matter. For a woman of the Brahmana, Chatri, or Vaishya class to accept another husband in the presence of the husband she has married, or to file for divorce or accept a boyfriend or paramour is unacceptable in the Vedic culture. Therefore, King Shayati, who did not know the real facts of Chaivana Muni's transformation, was surprised to see the behavior of his daughter. 
Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Militangena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasiddhi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> In this material world known as the forest of material enjoyment, things happen. You start out with an innocent plan to enjoy. What's wrong with that? Isn't the purpose of our presence in this world to maximize your enjoyment? That seems, that motivation seems to be so innocent and universal. Yet, from that so-called innocent motivation to enjoy the material, to maximize our material contentment, from that motivation, all complications and tribulations are brought upon us. Krishna tries to explain this to us in Bhagavad Gita. Karyam karanam kartrite hetu prakritu uchite Purusha Sukadukana. Material nature provides an endless list of causes and effects. But Purusha Sukadukana, the living entity, the Purusha, the false enjoyer, is responsible for his or her own happiness and distress within the system that material nature has set up. Srila Prabhupada once explained that this is actually kind of funny. In that, the irony is that you didn't generate the whole web of material nature, yet you're held responsible for your interactions with that web. The example given is, someone prepares the rope and you hang yourself with it. You get the blame. Material nature, Krishna's explaining, it's doing its thing, so to speak. But you, by your search for material enjoyment, entangle yourself further in material nature and you get the blame for whatever happens after that. As they say, the rest is history. So where is our innocence? We tell ourselves, what's wrong with trying to carve out some happiness in this world? What's wrong with that? Establish a nice plateau for yourself. Yet, complications after complications happen. It's amazing, you can talk to so many persons and ask about their sojourn through life in terms of their material affairs. Things never turn out as they planned. You have an innocent vision of how your life will proceed. And then as you carry out your life, all kinds of complications, unexpected events happen. What to speak of what you can't see. Life is complicated enough based on the intricacies you do see, but what about all those you can't see? Who can see all the karmic reactions they're generating, all the karmic reactions that are awaiting them? Let's quickly review this story, this history of Sukanya Chaivanamuni. Innocent walk through the forest to Chaivanamuni's ashram. Sukanya's father, a very upright Dharmic king, fully equipped with Vedic knowledge. He even knew how to perform yagyas, although he's a king, a chatriya. And as a saintly king, as a Rajarshi, he wanted to visit the ashram of Chaivanamuni. And he brought his daughter along. His daughter is described as Kamala Lotus eye. 
She's very beautiful. So everything seems to be in order. Great king, great father, uh, beautiful daughter, walk through the forest, destination, the ashram of a great sage, Chayvanamuni. Doesn't get any better than that. But as they approached the ashram, Sukanya decided to look in the forest for some fruits. We're not told whether the fruits were for her or as an offering for Chayvanamuni or... In any case, she happened by a hole in the ground that an earthworm would make. And in that hole, she saw two glowing substances. So the Bhagavatam describes that in ignorance and also as if impelled by providence. The Bhagavatam doesn't say uh, by providence, but as if by providence. It's material nature. Things happen. Mm -hmm. She didn't know what she was doing. She decided to get a thorn and experiment. She pierced those two glowing substances in the earthworm hole, and blood came out. We all know how young persons experiment with this, try this, try that. So she acted out of ignorance. The next thing is that her father noticed that he and all his attendant soldiers could no longer pass stool or urine. Highly uncomfortable feeling. The king thought about this. He was shrewd in terms of spiritual intelligence. What's happened? Someone must have made an offense to Chai Vanamuni. Now let's not rush past that judgment, that analysis by the king. He's a government head, yet he's able to detect when a saintly person has been offended. He's able to see the effects of that in the ordinary realm of things. He can add one plus one equals two based on his knowledge of Dharma, his saintly qualities. What ordinary government head would ever think like that? There's some disease going around. A saintly person must have been offended. But he immediately came to that conclusion after short deliberation. And he asked, who here has offended Chaivanamuni? And who was the one who spoke up? His daughter, his beautiful lotus-eyed daughter. She explained, I did it out of ignorance. I didn't know. Because now she understands. There's repercussions, severe repercussions to my little teenage activities. So Chai Vanamuni was in that hole, somehow or other, with his yogic prowess. So the king knew what had to be done. He had to beg for forgiveness for the foolishness done by his daughter. He approached that earthworm hole, which he knew this is actually where Chai Vanamuni is residing by, with his mystic yogic powers. And he begged forgiveness on behalf of his daughter. She did it ignorantly. Please forgive her for this offense. And what was Chaivanamuni's response? Is your daughter married? <laughs> the king understood immediately what's going on. If we're going to pacify Chaivanamuni and get free from this curse, I've got to give him my daughter in marriage. So, indeed, that happened. So, you might say, fine, all right. Uh, <laughs> girl's got to marry sometime or another. Yeah, she married a great sage. Let it be. However, that great sage was a very old, physically decrepit man. Yeah. His 
Bhagavatam describes veins were showing all over his body. He was gray. His skin was slack. He looked like he was at the end of his years, materially, although spiritually he was a great sage. And what about his wife? She's in the prime of her teenage years, a devastating beauty. Now she's married to this person who looks like he's on his deathbed. Far older. He's the age of her grandfather. And this is going to be her life. So what would you say to that? That was horrible for her. What a horrible fate. What about her enjoyment? What about her happiness? But how are we thinking about happiness and enjoyment? The Vedic system emphasizes duty and commitment. In that way, through duty and commitment, authorized duty and commitment, then your mind and senses become under control and then you can start to think about what is happiness. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, how can there be happiness without peace? And in order to have inner peace, you've got to control your senses, you have to have transcendental knowledge. Our sequencing is that first we say bring the happiness. <laughs> Step number one. But what Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita is control your senses, get transcendental knowledge, uh, uh, have a peaceful mind, and then we talk about happiness. <laughs> and that's even true for material happiness. Without, as Prahlad Maharaj told Hiranyakashipu, if you can't control your mind, that wild mind will create so many artificial friends and enemies. While conquering everything around you, he told his father, you failed to conquer the enemies within. There's no enemy other than the uncontrolled mind. And what was Hiranyakashipu's response? Uh, are you trying to say that you're better than me at controlling the senses? <laughs> Remember, Hiranyakashipu had performed such severe austerities that Lord Brahma came to see him to ask, what benediction do you want? And here is little five-year-old Pallad talking to his father in that way. His father took offense. Like, <laughs> Who are you? Are you violating my power to rule you? Where do you get this arrogance from, this strength? He asked the famous question, Kimbala, where, is, where does your strength come from? Because the materialistic mindset is always concerned with strength, force, power. Hiranyakashipu was perplexed. Everyone knows all the demigods tremble in fear because of me. Yet you are defying my power to rule you. What is going on? Pallad had tried to tell him the truth. Your real problems are within. You can't control your mind. Therefore, how can there be a life free from anxiety for you? So let us think. We're so conditioned, we're so trained up that where's my happiness? As soon as the day starts, instinctively, habitually, we start to think, how am I going to be happy today? How is happiness going to come to me today? Because this is Kali Yuga, we don't understand the prerequisites <laughs> even for material happiness. What to speak of spiritual? But even for material happiness, we don't know how to go about it. So therefore, Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, the forerunners to happiness, even as ordinarily understood. Uh, you have to control the enemies within. You have to have knowledge. Then your mind becomes peaceful. Then we talk about happiness. Understanding that, we can see deeper insight into Sukanya's situation. Because ordinarily, if you look at it through contemporary lenses, 
She's a beautiful teenage girl married to this old withered man with pale gray skin and you can see the veins all over his body He's looking decrepit. What kind of future is that for a young girl? Sounds totally hellish. But she understood the Vedic system is about duty. executing one's authorized duty, no matter what the circumstances are. And that's the point that Prabhupada makes in the purport, that these are the values of Vedic culture. Of course, we don't have Vedic culture now, and so much of our recourse, so much of our solution is based on chant Hare Krishna with attention. But gradually you find out that if you're going to chant Hare Krishna with attention, you need a lifestyle that is favorable. And a favorable lifestyle is not based on running after happiness here and there, adjusting our situations for more happiness this way, that way. That's not a favorable lifestyle for chanting Hare Krishna. In the beginning, yes, we tell everyone, no matter what your situation, just chant here the glories of the Supreme Personality of God. But that chanting, if done attentively, gradually brings you to the realization, I have to do some lifestyle engineering. <laughs> I've got to shape my life so that I have a favorable situation and circumstances for chanting Hare Krishna. And that means to stop this futile endeavor to constantly juggle circumstances so that you so-called increase your happiness. We often speak about a very mm, sometimes difficult conception that the Shastra presents. Your sum total of happiness and distress is already packed into your body. You can't alter that. When people hear this, they often think, are you trying to say I should just do nothing? They can't see another alternative. That don't endeavor to try and increase your happiness. Instead, endeavor to increase your spiritual life. Because, as Prahlad explains, you're going to get your material happiness in the right dosage anyway, just as you get the material distress in your right dosage. So generally, people start thinking, hmm, it's true. I don't endeavor for distress, yet it comes. So you mean if I don't endeavor for happiness, material happiness in the right amount will still come? OK, I'm starting to get it. But what do you do if you don't endeavor for happiness? We're so wired up. We're hardwired to do that. What, without that, what do you, how do you live? Because <laughs> they have no idea of another arena of endeavor. So basically, the Bhagavatam is telling you, you know, change arenas, change stadiums. <coughs> it's not that you become inactive. <coughs> it's not that you become lazy. You endeavor in a different way. That is bhakti. Arjuna demonstrates in Bhagavad Gita full activity, full investment in acting. As Krishna said, Mama Nushma, Yujim Cha, fight and think of me. The more we think about this in a deep way, the more we can understand how Sukanya's situation was not like slavery or mm, hellish. She accepted her situation. My father said I should marry him. I'll do that, I'll execute my duties. But today, that would be considered the most terroristic situation. She's bottled up. Her opportunities are denied. Why can't she enjoy her way? It's, it seems like she's condemned. But you see, she's accepting the Vedic system, knowing that that system will gradually show her the best. 
I'm due a certain amount of happiness and distress in this life. That situation has come upon me in ignorance. I, did, I offended this great sage. I didn't mean it. I didn't know it. But things happen. I'm, I'm interacting with material nature. Uh, intricacies happen. So let me, instead of juggling, expending energy, agitating my mind, trying to adjust my circumstances, let me accept my Vedic duty and proceed with life. It's very exotic to us. It sounds very, very strange. Because we're burning with that Rajogun uh, impulse that you got to go for your own happiness no matter what. <laughs> you have a right to pursue happiness. And we're definitely running hard trying to get it. If you don't use your short life in the quest for happiness, you're useless. In this way, the Vedic system seems quite alien to us because we're so attached to this passionate activity of struggling for happiness. It seems justified, yes? Look, all right, sometimes it's a struggle, but it's for happiness. Everyone, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> no problem, I understand. <laughs> That's why when Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, prakriti stani karshati, struggling in the oppressive material atmosphere, we think, yeah, sometimes it's a struggle, but <laughs> it's all for our own happiness. <laughs> What Bhagavatam is presenting is how to have a lifestyle in which you don't struggle for material happiness. Not only do you not struggle for material happiness, but you also are aiming for something beyond material happiness and distress. All that motivation, all those dynamics are built within the classic Vedic system. But today we have no such system prevalent. We are dependent on chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. But as stated before, our chanting, sooner or later we realize, depends on having a favorable lifestyle. And we can't chant the holy name in a humble state of mind if we're constantly trying to adjust our material circumstances to get more material happiness, more material comfort. So it gets a bit tricky because you say, well, then what's the point of my doing anything? Whether my household duties or whatever ashram I'm in, what's the point? But the Shastra says, you must do your duty. Krishna himself says that in Bhagavad Gita. You do your duty, but you don't get the fruits. <sighs> this is a raw deal, isn't it? Look, I finally sorted myself out. I realize I got to do my duty. Great, then I get the fruits. But Krishna says, Kamani Eva Dakata say, yes, you're, do your duty, do your Vedic duty, but you can't enjoy the fruits. This is tough for us because we're so hardwired for fruit of enjoyment, material happiness. So, for all these reasons, it's tough for a contemporary person. To understand Sukanya's submissiveness. Like, come on, kick the guy out. <laughs> take his money or take his mystic powers. <laughs> In Australia, the ladies, the material ladies, have a motto and when you leave him, don't get angry, get everything. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so then what happens? Intricacies continue. Mm. She's faithfully serving Chaivana Muni, who's not only ugly and old, but he's irritable on top of that. It doesn't get any, it doesn't get any worse. It doesn't, things don't get any, this is as bad as it gets. <laughs> but she still goes on with her obligations. 
she must have something else in her mind to allow her to continue in that situation. She must be trained in a certain way. She must have a different vision of what human life's all about. So then, the Ashvini Kumars, the physicians of the heavenly planets, they happen by. And Chaivana Muni says, I'd like to become a beautiful, attractive young man, because that's what the ladies like. So the Ashvini Kumars say, all right, come with us, all three of us. There were two Ashvini Kumars and Chaivana Muni. We'll dip into this lake. And they did that, and they all emerged as beautiful young men. Now, Sukanya had a problem. Which one is her husband? So according to the contemporary mindset, what would we say? Hey, just pick, you know, pick whatever one you want, you know? <laughs> Whether he's your actual husband or not, hey, you know, just do the best you can, you know what I mean? You know? <laughs> Who can blame you, you know? Things happen, you know? <laughs> Maybe time for a change. <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> but what did she do? She called out to the Ashwini Kumars because she couldn't recognize who were the Ashwini Kumars and which one was her husband. So she took shelter of the Ashwini Kumars, meaning taking shelter means she asked, please give me guidance. Whoever the two Ashwini Kumars are among you three, please indicate who's my husband. This is a Vedic culture. Hearing, approaching authority to resolve a situation that's beyond the range of your senses. Appreciate the situation she was in. She, she couldn't tell which one was her husband and she's a, such a chaste lady. She's helpless. So she inquired. She asked for guidance. My senses cannot detect what is the actual situation I need to hear? Just as Arjuna approaches Krishna in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Karpanya, Bhutosha, Bhutasvabhava. I'm bewildered, I'm confused, I don't know what my duty is. Shishish Teham Sharimam Tam Prabhanyam. Now I'm your disciple of soul surrendered unto you. Please teach, please talk. Let me see through your words. Sukanya did that. She took shelter of the Ashwini Kumars, and then they revealed, this one is your husband. Things should end at that point, but the intricacies continue. This is life in the material world. Her father comes to visit her and sees her with a beautiful young man. What in the world are you doing? I have never seen something so abominable. You have given up your husband to marry, to associate with this young man. He's scorching her. Probably these days, what would a father say? Good on you. <laughs> you, you, got some, you got a young one, huh? Great, whatever makes you happy, dear. <laughs> your parents, <laughs> you know, we support whatever makes you happy. Follow your dream. <laughs> I've called your mother who lives, you know, the other side of the city, you know, with her third husband, and, you know, <laughs> we, we, well, we all just said, hey, whatever, life is short, you know. <laughs> do what you got to do. <laughs> and Sukanya proudly, the Acharyas emphasized, she was proud in a good way. She's proud of her chasteness. She explained to her father what happened, and he became very happy. She had self-respect. She had dignity because of her chasteness. So she proudly told her father with a smiling face, no, this is my husband. I haven't done anything wrong. The intricacies go a bit further, as you'll hear tomorrow in the coming days. Indra gets a bit upset. Uh, so let us think about the course of material activities and our so-called innocent desire to interact with material nature and enjoy. Things happen. You may recall about five months ago, 
six months ago, in the holiday season, shopping season in northern Idaho, one housewife was at Walmart with her, her nieces. She had about four female nieces under the age of 11, and she had her two-year-old child seated in the shopping cart, and they were going up and down the rows, and she went to look at something on the rows. She's right nearby the cart, but she was reaching. And her two-year-old child reaches into her purse, pulls out her gun, and shoots her. Is it a true story? Huh? She's dead. Right in front of her you know, nieces, who are all under 11. The, uh, how do you explain this? A two-year-old child reaches into her purse, pulls out her gun, and at point-blank range, fires the gun. How do you, uh, materially, it doesn't make any sense, but things happen. The local government leaders in Northern Idaho were saying, now this is no reason to change the gun laws. <laughs> the real issue is whether she should have brought the gun into the store. That's the issue. There's no question that we should think about changing any gun laws. Because especially in northern Idaho, gun culture reigns supreme. We don't want to touch that. This was a tragedy, yes. Uh, so we need to understand why would she bring the gun into Walmart? <sighs> Conditioned souls really know how to make a mess of things and continue to make a mess of things. Like now in California, everyone's talking about the great drought. Uh, Australia went through this maybe 15 years ago. Uh, the end of water, what are we gonna do? So they invested $10 billion, the equivalent of 10 billion US dollars in building five desalination plants. You know, they take seawater and get the salt out and convert it to drinking water, uh, usable water. $10 billion. And then what happened? The rains came. <laughs> <laughs> The reservoirs have all been full for over 10 years. Those $10 billion desalination plants have been idle, have never been in operation. <laughs> so now in California they say, no, no, our desalination plants you know, are using the latest technology, the expenses won't be so high, and uh, who knows? You can't control material nature. <laughs> One minute you think you're in a drought, no rain for years, and then year after year, so much rain, so much rainfall. Our bhakti lesson is that we don't take shelter of material nature. We are fully aware of the intricacies that can happen by associating with material nature. We take shelter of Krishna who is the master of the material energy and the master of our senses. In that way, we'll have the best opportunity for living in this material world for the most productive reason. How to satisfy Krishna. Satisfying Krishna is even a higher goal than getting out of the material world. Yes, Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam will give you the information how to get out of the material world. But even higher than that is simply how to satisfy Krishna, regardless of all the intricacies and complexities of material existence. So we get a healthy education about material nature and its complications. We get a healthy education about our so-called innocent desire to enjoy and make a nice place in the world. We find out it's not very innocent at all. In this way, we have a much higher goal than constantly battling material circumstances, trying to get a favorable situation in which we can be happy. That goal is rejected by Srimad Bhagavatam. We can learn from this ongoing drama of Chaivana Muni, Sukanya, the Ashvini Kumaras, and next you're going to hear Indra is going to weigh in because he's angry about something and Chaivana Muni will take care of him. All right, any questions? Yes.
Thank you, Mr. Uh, you mentioned that duty, commitment, and responsibility. Uh, some thoughts came to my mind to formulate the question. Uh, sometimes when we go to college and universities, very often we see uh, awareness about sexual harassment, rape, and uh, all sorts of things came to my mind, thinking that Prabhupada mentioned children, women, Brahmanas are not to be punished. And another one, famous quote, also that women, they're supposed to be protected by the husband, by the son, and the father, when the, when the husband is, not, is absent, and by the husband, son, and the father. So then, my question is, uh, uh, in regards to responsibility, or can we say that actually the government or the leaders have more to blame in this regard? After all, if we say that the women are like child sometimes, they're more innocent, easy, easy to be subdued. Uh, if we don't have Brahmanas now in this modern society to be trained in the public. So is it correct to think, Maharaj, that Actually, if it's someone to blame, a fault to find, is it the leaders of the, of the government? What I tell them is what I feel is the truth. It's the men who are to blame. Mm -hmm. The ladies will say, protection from who? <laughs> These men are, often are so weak uh, by the way they devise society. Uh, think about Srila Prabhupada's analysis. The men created this game in which the ladies can do whatever they like. The men created that game so the men could plunder. And by the process of the men plundering, they become so weak. And so naturally the ladies say, you guys are going to protect us? Generally speaking. So in this way, everything goes down. But why not blame the men? 